to that individual. Otherwise, just ask a general question and I'll, I'll try to direct it in the right way. All right, so let's, uh, let's begin. Let's start, uh, gentleman over here in the white hat. Thank you, and this question is for John. Um, it's a legal question. If you do decide to register your assault weapons, to what extent are you foregoing your Fourth Amendment rights? All right, so we start off with the, the easy one. The very simple question, of course. Um, so under the laws, when it comes to assault weapons, he's inferring to the fact that if you register an assault weapon, you're there for allowing yourself to be inspected, I think it's about one time per year, uh, to make sure your assault weapon is in compliance and still with you and everything like that. I believe that is originally under the law for FFLs that carry assault weapon permits and dangerous weapon permits. Uh, they are required to go undergo an inspection beyond the typical uh, once a year inspection from uh, the DOJ, uh, just to maintain general firearms records. Uh, I would argue that that is not gonna apply to the individual and I've yet to see the law that specifically applies it to the individual. But if uh, someone brings it up to me, I'd be glad to look at it and let you know. But I would argue that no, you do not give up your Fourth Amendment rights under that. And if anyone ever knocked on your door claiming that, uh, lock your door and call an attorney immediately. Uh, and, yeah. In other words, always default to I do not consent and then call a lawyer. Okay, over here. Then, uh, real quick, Carl, before we go, I just want yeah. to recognize the guy that answered, or asked that question is Mark Hanton. He's a CRPA board member and on the NRA's uh, law enforcement committee, right? So he does a ton for us. He lives right here in San Diego, very involved, and uh, a big advocate for CRPA and NRA. So. Excellent. Thank you. All right, the gentleman here in the blue shirt. Would it be legal to take your a bullet button and make it inoperable by using like a liquid steel or something like that? Liquid steel to make it inoperable. How does that comply with the law? If you can prove that it's inoperable and it's a, a permanently affixed magazine, yes, you could. I mean, that as long as you're complying with the law. The, the, the challenge you're going to have is where do you get to make that argument? At, you know, in jail or out of jail. Okay. And to expand on that, uh, there's also no true definition of what is permanent under the law. So uh, the, the liquid uh, compound that hardens up, you know, if you have a hammer and chisel, it technically could you know, take it apart. You could also do that with a lot of other stuff, including welding. Uh, so the more lengths you go to to make something permanent, the better. All right, gentlemen up at the top. Uh, Thank you all. Uh, this has been very informative. Uh, the question I have is more general for all of you. Um, with what looks to be our next incoming governor of this state, do you feel that the fight is going to get a more difficult fight? Are you referring to a specific person you think that is uh, got a lock on that race or in Gavin general? Gavin Newsom. Yeah. I would not assume that any one individual has a lock on that race. Uh, because a bunch of Democrats are running and all sorts of crazy stuff could happen. Uh, but let, let's talk about that in terms of the gubernatorial race. Uh, thoughts on Second Amendment issues in the gubernatorial race. I, I think we're, we're going to continue to see a real tough time in California until we can present some real consequences. Um, a lot of the feedback from the Assembly and the State Senate on these, this last round of ridiculous laws was, why wouldn't I do this? There's no resistance. There's no, there's no consequences, there's no punishment. And they go back to their districts and they, they're in their bubble. Um, and then people say, oh, gee, golly, gosh, you know, look at what you did, that's so great. Um, so no matter who the governor is, uh, no matter who uh, you know, is in the, uh, you know, runs or, and, and wins, you know, until we provide real, true consequences for their political career, um, you know, remove them from office or you know, shame them in the media, um, that sort of thing, uh, we're going to continue to have a real difficult time. Um, you know, is it going to be Kevin DeLeon? Is it going to be uh, Gavin Newsom? You know, I don't know. But uh, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be the same problem with whatever stuff suit they put up for, for governor. And, you know, because we have a Prop 14 system, you, you all may remember that in the last uh, election, November 2016, uh, in the runoff, 
There were, for the U.S. Senate seat that Barbara Boxer thankfully uh, vacated, there were only two choices, and they were both Democrats because the Republicans didn't uh, get their act together and field one candidate. They, feel, they fielded like 14, uh, and they all canceled each other out. In this race, um, there are uh, right now, I think, uh, five Democrats that are running. John Chang, who's the state, state treasurer, uh, Gavin Newsom, Antonio Villagrosso, uh, we got uh, that lady who used to be California superintendent of schools, and she's running on schools. There you go. That's how, how, how much of a shot she has. Um, I don't even remember her name, and I, I'm paid to know this. And then um, Tom Steyer, who's uh, all about climate change. He's, he's, in a, he's a billionaire. On the Republican side, um, you got that potted plant down at City Hall, Kevin Faulkner, who probably should just run as a Democrat because he's a bit more um, aligned over there. And no one really else, John Cox from Rancho Santa, Santa Fe's thing about running, but nobody knows him. So uh, here's the bad news. We could end up with uh, just uh, one Democrat, uh, sorry, two Democrats on the ballot. But there, there's an opportunity here. Number one is even if you have a Republican run for governor and they are destined to lose, instead of backing someone like Faulkner, who agrees with under, undermining the Second Amendment and is not going to fight, how about we get actually a really good spokesperson who's going to run and raise the issues even if they're not going to win? That's acceptable to me. You know, eventually you start educating enough people and they, they win. The other strategy could be that if you do have two Democrats in that runoff, um, can people who care about the Second Amendment go to those two candidates and say, look, um, you've been really bad on our issues, but you know, we either are going to sit this race out or we're going to take our 35% block of votes and we're going to make the kingmaker here. So what guarantees do we have on Second Amendment? Will you address some of these issues? Now, we don't know what they're going to do once they're in office, probably kowtow to the same constituency that got them there, but it's at least an opportunity for us to have a seat at the table and potentially sway the race one way or another. So those are two things to think about in the current way we elect the governor. And, and we're a nonpartisan group. Uh, we don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, you know, whatever. We're, we're a pro-Second Amendment group. And one thing I want to remind everybody, we talk a lot about the pistol roster. That was passed under a Republican governor. So, uh, you know, I just care about whether they respect our, our Second Amendment rights or not. Yeah, uh, the other thing to think about is the way you have to think about these issues and what to expect with different representatives or different uh, federal administrations. Uh, you really have to always expect that it's going to get worse. You always have to expect that it, there's going to be a fight and that it's a never-ending fight. I will guarantee you that anyone who is opposed to Second Amendment rights in California uh, they are always thinking about it and they're always working on it. Uh, they don't stop and they don't ever expect it uh, to get worse for them, but they don't expect to get better and they act like that. And that's why you have a continuing push every single year with new legislation, new laws, everything. We have to look at this as this is a never ending fight that you constantly have to address. Whether or not you have an administration that's wholly aligned with you, you have representatives that are wholly aligned with you, the way you have to approach it in your thinking is that there's always an issue, there's always a fight. Otherwise, you become complacent and you start not paying attention to the laws that are being passed. You start not paying attention to your representatives, which I think is what uh, we have currently in California in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. We've seen that and the effect that has on the Second Amendment. Go ahead. Thank you all for your commitment and passion for contributing today. The question is, because I'm going to get drilled in the, when I get home, and it was answered in the panel a little earlier, but I just want to put a scenario out. For loaning a gun at an organized event at a shooting range, is it permissible for the group or an individual to provide a weapon to shoot while they're still under supervision of the group or the individual at an organized event at the range? 
Yeah, so like I said, as long as you're within the presence of the person you're handing the gun to, and like you said, the organization supplies the guns or the instructor supplies the guns for the class, as long as they're there, still in control in the presence of the person and those uh, guns never leave that presence or that range, you're going to be okay. You've I, acquired whatever Donald Trump had during the debates. Go ahead. Hi. First, thank you for offering this forum. Uh, two questions, probably for uh, Mr. Dillon. Uh, there's currently a 10-day wait for the background check to purchase a firearm. How can the uh, California Attorney General reconcile the need for that to the courts with the claim of instant background checks for the purchase of ammunition? And second one, regarding the possibility of a required license to be allowed to purchase ammunition or even the firearm safety card to purchase a firearm, how are these not comparable to requiring a license or a fee to register, or a license or a fee to exercise the right to vote? All right, so your first question regarding the comparison and how do you uh, come to a rational conclusion between the 10-day wait and then the need for immediate background checks, uh, there's no rational answer uh, for that conflict. Uh, I've yet to see a good reasoning behind this, the 10 day wait uh, uh, in honesty and we have it in court right now and the state states that even in the narrow exception of someone who already owns a gun someone or someone who has a CCW license so theoretically a person walking into a store with a gun on their hip would still have to wait 10 days uh, in order to purchase a firearm because they would need a cool down method or cool down time period it makes no sense, yet the state accepts that as rational reasoning and thought. Um, so I can't really give you an answer on how these things don't conflict with each other. How about the second do. question? Uh, second question, uh, repeat it again just so I can really answer it properly. A license to okay, yeah. be able to buy ammunition. How is that not, uh, how is that cool with uh, not being able to have a license or requiring a feed in order to vote. So in general, I would say that uh, these license requirements or safety test requirements are because uh, they're used in, based on safety. It's not, uh, there's no danger in voting, I would say, uh, when you come in and you vote. <laughs> Bear with me on that, yeah. Uh, but a threat to public safety in the sense of a weapon being in uh, the public. So. I believe their argument is that, one, that we're just ensuring that you're safe with your gun and you're not gonna hurt yourself accidentally. We're just making sure you're okay. It's public safety that everyone who owns a gun properly knows how to operate that gun. I think it's a very weak argument. Again, um, I don't see a lot of difference between the two. Yep, go ahead. I have a question on 80% AR pistols. How does that, how are they affected with what we've talked about earlier today? And also, John, are you the lawyer that if we had a home defense situation, we would be calling? So well, if you need any lawyer for anything, this is the guy you call. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, yes, I, I do uh, work on self-defense issues, and I would be a person to call in a self-defense situation, uh, especially if you're a CCW holder, but in general, if someone breaks in your house, that's something that uh, me and my firm can handle. So that's the easy answer uh, question. With regard to 80% pistols, and, I'm assume, and you said AR pistols, I believe. Yeah. So now we have entered into a... The, probably one of the bigger gray areas in the law. Uh, and I, honestly, I'd want a good hour with you uh, yeah. to really explain everything you need to know when it comes to manufacturing uh, a AR pistol under the law and do it correctly. Uh, unfortunately, right now, as of you know, January 1st, 2017, uh, creating an AR pistol is not really going to work because we've had previous laws that passed in 2015 uh, that got rid of the single so shot exemption when it came to handguns. That was originally how people were properly making 80% uh, AR pistols. They would make it in a single shot uh, format, uh, single shot uh, 
form with the certain length requirements. And then after that was built as a single shot pistol, it was then converted afterwards into a semi-automatic firearm. So that was the legal way to do it. Since then, they have changed the single shot exemption laws, which uh, make it much more difficult to do that. In fact, I, there's an argument that you couldn't even do it right now if you wanted to in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but it is a gray area. There are arguments on both sides. I know there are FFLs that have had to deal with these issues, and John would be a great person to talk to on his take. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't really give you a perfect answer right now. All right, because so that's it's hard. <laughs> one on one for an hour. Go up to the top. Go ahead. Uh, Carl, I think this one. Without someone doing something about it, it's not going to get any better.